All right, the discussion and the study of populism is quite widespread. That's not a secret anymore. Ranging from populist actors to populist citizens, the scholarship is vast and our knowledge has exponentially increased, especially in the past couple of decades. We gained insights into the new populist parties, various populist leaders, consolidation of the populist radical right, emergence of the populist left in Europe, the emergence of a potential new wave of populism in Latin America, the Trump phenomenon, the Brexit campaign, et cetera, et cetera. Our study of the phenomenon is so extensive that we're also moving beyond what we can call the usual suspects. And we're starting to examine populism in less obvious contexts and settings. An important question that remains uh, in this regard is the extent to which this phenomenon actually translates to or is adopted by the non-populist mainstream. We know that populists are populist, obviously, and we know that populists rely on populist rhetoric. But what about their non-populist counterparts? Do they observe and learn or do they adopt and reject? Do they strategically adjust or do they maintain their course? For example, after far-right parties put immigration on the agenda in the 1980s, we slowly started seeing traditional parties not only take an explicit position related to immigration, but also saw them formulate similar positions as the far right. This continues to be one of the reasons why scholars refer to the right-wing shift of European politics. Now, considering how pervasive populism is these days, we can, or perhaps even should ask, if we can observe a similar evolution or trend when it comes to populism. In that regard, I'm having a conversation today with Patricia Rodi to gain some insights into the extent to which uh, mainstream actors actually adopt populism. So, Patricia, first things first, there are several different and a wide variety of interpretations of what populism is exactly. Can you briefly describe what for you uh, populism is exactly and how we can observe it. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you for having me. Um, so I always start, you know, when we speak about populism, it is obviously a very, as you mentioned as well, it's a contentious concept. And I, I always think it's quite good to quote Houdain, who quite forthrightly said, you know, populism is sexy. Um, and I think that it does, that reflects the increased appeal, you know, of populism as this like widely used term that, that we use both in social science, but also in media discourse. So I <clears throat> specifically, in my research, I make use of a concept, concept that is developed, especially, but obviously not exclusively in social media, in social movement studies, uh, which is the master frame. So um, I conceptualize it as a, a discursive master frame that centers on an anti-elitist discourse in the name of the sovereign people. And I argue that obviously there, there's loads of different types of conceptualizations to, to populism. Uh, and one you know, of the most mainstream and the dominant one is, is populism as an ideology. Uh, but I argue within my research that populism or the exclusive focus on populism as an ideology is in many instances overly constrained and, and essentialized. And so uh, to provide, obviously because my research looks at the discursive elements and the um, how mainstream parties communicate populism um, by, by essentially conceptualize it as a, as a discourse or as a discursive master frame, uh, it provides more of an analytical tool to, to elect a more fine-grained understanding of populism um, on, on, a, on a discursive level, so to say. So, uh, um, yeah, that's the baseline of it. Okay, so in 2004, Cass Miller wrote this article positing that we can observe this kind of populist zeitgeist, right? Kind of that populism is arguably very widespread or at least spreading not only to other countries, but also across uh, the mainstream. And we observe it more and more amongst so-called traditional political actors as well. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you have looked to, uh, looked at, sorry, into your research as well, right? So tell us a little bit about that. What's the, the main argument there of, of what you are looking at? Okay, yeah, as, as you said, oh, 
there is this, you know, there's been an increased electoral success of, of populist parties and specifically populist radical right wing parties. And because of that, we've heard Kas Mude write about the populist zeitgeist, but we also have heard, you know, about the contagious effect, popularization of populism. And that suggests that, you know, populism has, as Mude said, you know, become an ever more appealing political tool for also mainstream parties. Mm -hmm. And that means that it's become an integral part of the discursive appeal of various parties, not just the populist. So um, the, the importance of exploring, you know, this idea of a popular sidecast and whether or not that is valid is evident in the light of the assumption that populism could or, you know, indeed does pose a threat to stable and liberal democracies. And I think that a lot of scholars have raised the issue that populist views can create polarized effects uh, and cause the frag fragmentation of political systems. So if we follow that logic, if mainstream actors then start to copy this type of populist narratives that are expressed by the populist parties, then it might spread, but it also might change the basis of specific political cultures or even transform liberal, you know, the liberal character of Western democracies. So I think that we hear a lot of these like, you know, populism, populist zeitgeist, the contagious effect of populism, a lot of mainstream parties have become, you know, populist, but the paradoxical fact remains that although a lot of scholars and pundits argue that, you know, populism has become an integral part of, of various parties, of the discursive appeals of various parties, there is not that much uh, research that actually focus on the discursive and rhetorical elements of populism uh, and specifically how this is adopted by mainstream parties. So what I saw when I started to look at this broad scholarship is that uh, a lot of studies don't distinguish between how political actors actually make use of the main signifiers of populism, so broadly considered to be the people and the elite. And my, what I wanted to do with my research was to uh, try to fill, fill that gap, essentially. Um, and I, I think that it's really only when we dissect and, and unpack populism to look at how uh, the two main signifiers, the people and the elite, are employed by the mainstream parties that we can, we can be certain if and how uh, the contamination of populism has taken place on a discursive level. Because the point is that if mainstream parties do not really employ the same framing uh, as populist parties, uh, you know, if they're not copycatting or they're not copycats, uh, then this persistent and really, really dominant claim that, you know, we are living with a populist side, guys, uh, may not be as secure as, as, as its protagonist suggests. So um, that's where my, my research sits and why I wanted to, um, to look into this more in depth. Uh, so you, you refer to, to these two populist signifiers, right? The people and the elites. And I think we can agree that however we or you or I decide to define populism, that's pretty much what everybody degree, agrees on. Absolutely. So in your research, like how do you measure or, or these amongst mainstream political actors, these populist signifiers of the people and the elite, how do you get a grip, a grip on those two concepts really? <clears throat> so it's a really good question. So when I started to look at all the previous research, obviously um, I uh, conduct uh, content analysis uh, on my in my study. So I started to look at the content analytical uh, approaches that are or were already out there to measure populism, uh, but specifically those ones that measure populism as a matter of degree. So that we see populism not as um, something static, but something that can be, you know, adopted by, uh, by polit political actors uh, uh, across the spectrum. Um, so I specifically saw that either a lot of these measurements were quite, um, quite vague in that they just had maybe two operational questions that they said, oh, does, does the political actor uh, talk about the people? Or does the political actor say not send something negative about the elite? Obviously, this is very, <laughs> you know, uh, 
very not as as it was but um what i thought was that that doesn't really um gather what populism is because it's not just about talking about the people and it's not just about saying something negative about the elite but it's the, about the antagonism and how we speak about the elite and how we speak about the the, the people so um, I took inspiration from the COST uh, network on populist political communication um, and prior scholarship, obviously, that have developed uh, code books and I tried to incorporate more of a fine grained um, account and how to actually, uh, you know, operational questions to actually capture the people, people centrism and anti anti elitism, but also uh, more of a broader categorization of how within a populist account how parties can actually construct and articulate the people and the elite so not for example um you know the people as one we see in right-wing discourse for example that they speak a lot about the cultural perception of the people so whether or not that's the type of uh, discursive frame that we see also transcend into the discourse of, of of mainstream parties. So um, I, by taking this synthesized approach to, to a code book, uh, or a, more of like a multi-indicator measurements than I think we've seen previously, um, is that it, it focused on the lowest common denominator of populism, which I think is really important, is focus on what it says that it's supposed to focus on, on populism spef specifically. Uh, and then also by employing more of a multi-indicator measure, as I said, it, you can capture uh, populism in addition to, to the distinct elements. Uh, um, and that is significantly important uh, because it engages with the concept that Luke March speaks about, which is democism. Um, and democism is essentially, in, in um, Luke March's article, he speaks a lot about that what we are seeing isn't really a populist zeitgeist, but a demotic zeitgeist. So a lot of mainstream parties might not employ um, an anti elitist discourse in the name of the sovereign people, but they might just speak about the sovereign people without this anti elitist element. And obviously that's not populism. And he says that this is more uh, of a characteristic of what mainstream parties does. So I wanted to not only look at it in combination, whether or not we see populism, but also whether or not these parties do employ people centrism or do they employ anti elitism or do they in fact employ mm -hmm. populism and how that, um, um, how that connected to each other. All right, so, okay. so we have an expectation or at least let's say we, we adopt this, the, the Moodian zeitgeist framework. A lot of people adhere to that or, or, or see that happening you've chosen a very specific way of actually examining whether we can observe that obviously you know the million dollar question <laughs> can we actually uh, see it what are your findings in this regard so um the main <laughs> my findings suggest that uh, populism has not become an integral part of the discursive appeals of the mainstream parties so, um mainly that is because we, I don't find levels, I don't find high levels of populism within, I look specifically, I should mention, I look at manifestos and speeches and televised debates and I look over a 20 year period uh, and I compare uh, central left parties, um, central parties or liberal parties and central right parties and populist parties, both on the right and left uh, in four different countries. So in total, I. I examined 17 parties um, over a 20 year period. So it's four electoral um, uh, periods that I look at. And the point is that these, they don't, mainstream parties don't employ the same construct as the populist con contenders do. They are no copycats, uh, uh, irrespective of, of cross case contextual variety. Um, so it doesn't really matter if Main, if populist parties have become electorally successful, as we've seen in the case of Denmark, or whether or not, obviously in 2009, the populist radical right lost a lot, but didn't matter 
the narrative of, of political parties haven't really changed, despite the fact that in many countries, the populist radical right or the populist parties have increased electorally. Um, so they are not prone to employ populism. They're more, what I found specifically, and that again ties in with the demotic zeitgeist that Marx spoke of, is that a lot of the mainstream parties, they are much more prone to employ these um, the subframes, the populist subframes of people centrism and anti elitism, completely separate. They're not in combination with each other. And I think that, you know, um, that's really, really interesting. But more specifically, of course, I did find some variation within the parties as well, uh, and across countries and also across sources, which I think was even more important to highlight was that. Uh, manifestos more generally were very, they didn't have a lot of, uh, of low levels of populism, whilst speeches and televised debate was a little bit higher. Uh, and again, I think that that also reflects the disparity that we've seen in the scholarly literature that uh, scholars who focus on manifestos specifically find low levels of populism, but those who focus on speeches find a little bit higher levels. So that might also reflect that also reflects in my in my studies. So, um, and then I also obviously find, you know, um, within countries and the UK more specifically was a case where I did find when I looked at the cases comparatively and compared my five cases was that in the UK was higher levels compared to the three other countries. And I did see that the Conservative Party were more prone to adopt the same type of framing that the populist UK UK did. So again, quite a very interesting finding in, in, in that sense. All right. So if we then reflect back on the original thesis by, by Kastmude, does it necessarily mean that we should reject it, rethink it, maybe complement it, build on it? Like how do you how do you see it? Like how do you put your findings into into perspective and how do you draw any kind of implications from them? So I think that we should obviously not disregard of the popular zeitgeist hypothesis or theory. I think that the whole point is that it, it also reflects the fact that, you know, over the past two decades, there has been these like developments in Europe. And it doesn't mean that we're not seeing that mainstream parties or mainstream political actors are actually employing populist discourses. That's not the point. But the point is that how, how do we, is it, is it such a zeitgeist that, that has been articulated? And I think that we need to, we need to be more careful in how we use populist because it, as an analytical tool, we want it to be useful and by overusing it so much that, you know, it is uh, both in, in academia, but also in the media in media discourse, uh, um, it does become somewhat obsolete uh, because uh, what is it that we're really looking for when we are talking about populism? And I think that, uh, so I would say in terms of like the, what we should do with, with the populist zeitgeist article uh, is that I think it should be complemented. And I think that it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a f resource that needs to be built on and it never stops. And I think that all of these, uh, uh, these new findings uh, complement to to understanding the phenomenon m much much better. Okay, thank you very much, Patricia, for these insights today. Thank you. Thank you.